So good morning. It's Tuesday, October 12th. It's my father-in-law's birthday. And we are going to work on lesson 2-6 today. Uh, we're going to be actually getting some um, understanding of ex exponential equations and models. So in 2-1, we experienced exponential um, growth using com um, the compound interest idea. And now we're going to build on that with symbols and using Desmos and modeling and such. Also a reminder that Thursday I will not be having um, the formal Zoom session. Um, I can be available if anybody wants to meet with me between like 9 and 10 a.m. before I leave town. Um, but I will have the videos. Um, the videos for 2.6 and 2.7 are already up on YouTube, and I'll have 2.8 up in the next day or so. And um, so I'm going to put an email out. It'd be good if everybody watched those videos and had their course pack filled in. And then next Tuesday, um, when we have our morning and our evening session, um, we'll just work on worksheets together. And then next Thursday, we're going to review together in class. So that's kind of how that will work. Um, so today, if everybody wants to turn to page 207. Um, so the quote today says, if I take 30 steps linearly, I get to 30. If I take 30 steps exponentially, I get to a billion. So we saw that in that compound interest um, and the exponential growth in lesson two one. So let's just um, kind of get our brains going here and describing what are the differences that we remember and have learned so far between linear and exponential growth. Anybody want to throw out anything? Um, linear continues at a constant rate. Okay, continues. Okay, <clears throat> and that continuing at a constant rate, how how can we describe that same thing using um, a math word? Like a math action that we do. I'm comparing it in a table, we usually look for this. Uh, slow. The slope, okay. And usually if it's growth, we're looking for that repeat addition, right? So repeat addition. Okay. <clears throat> and the other day we kind of drew what, what pictures would look like. So we said it could look something like this. It could look like this with a positive slope. If it actually goes straight up and down, it could go straight across. So straight lines. And then we also learned um, the word parameters. So in a y equals mx plus b, this is what our linear um, equation looks like. The parameters, which are the things that are changing for each. Um, linear equation or linear model, right? Our recipe, our M, which is the slope, and B, which is the Y intercept. You'll need that for the 2 5 worksheet. I'm asking about the parameters. So I'm looking for the slope and the Y intercept. And also a reminder I, I, I thought I kept hitting home on this, but when I'm asking you on a worksheet or in the midterm or in the workbook to interpret in the context of the story, I'm asking you to give me the who, what, when, and where of what's going on. Um, and, and whether it's slope or y-intercept or relative difference, I'm asking you to expand on the story of what's going on. Don't say the slope is this, or when x goes up, y goes down. I want to know specifically what's going on with our story with our units. OK, so now what do we know about exponential growth so far? Definitely not quite as much as we know over here.
any idea so far? What do we know about exponential growth compared to? Well, when we were looking at the tables in lesson two, one, we found that it was, um, it grows at a faster and faster rate. Um, and does anybody remember what the repeat math thing was for exponential? Um, multiplication. Yep, so we are looking for a repeat and multiplication. And <clears throat> we haven't really so much talked about a picture for exponential yet, but we're going to see today that exponential growth will look something like this along the x axis. And then we're also going to look at something that's called exponential decay today. And um, we did introduce the exponential model and we talked about um, compound interest. So it's y equals a times b to the x and the parameters, I'm gonna just spell them out here, but we're gonna get into the nitty gritties here in a little bit. The parameters for uh, exponential are a, which is our y-intercept. So that feels a little bit different because the other one is b. Um, on a linear, but A is our y-intercept as starting value. And B is our growth factor. Our growth factor is the thing that we're multiplying to get bigger or bigger, okay? And we're going to learn that R, which is um, our growth rate, I mean, um, the, like the relative um, change is equal to the growth factor minus one. So basically B minus one. And we're gonna dive into seeing how that plays out. Okay, so let's just jump right in. So page 208, so nobody's there. So it says, if most people won $15,000 on a game show, they'd go and spend it all on a spending spree, but not you, you're gonna save it. So I'm not gonna read through all that, but you're gonna, you're gonna be a saver. You're gonna put it into an investment um, and you're gonna pretend that you're not gonna just save it for a couple of years, but you're gonna save it for 40 years because you're gonna be really good about not touching that money. So this is what it looks like in a table form. Um, so this is when you made your, you won your $15,000. And then it looks like after seven years, they're showing us that we would have $24,086.72 in the account. Didn't touch it. That's a lot of interest, right? The difference between the seven year value and the 15,000 is over $9,000 in interest. Then the graph we generated is further than that seven years because the seven year mark is about right here. And then they showed us, this is actually what it's gonna look like um, to continuing to grow for that 40 year mark. So um, I'm going to let you start looking at two, three, and four, and I'm gonna touch base here in a minute and seeing if you can figure out what that growth, the um, growth multiplier is here in two and three. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen here for Desmos. Um, number two, they asked us to do the division. So I'm just gonna pick a couple and show you. So if I take 16,050 and divide by the 15,000, it looks like my multiplier, my growth factor is 1.07. I'm just gonna do like a uh, year six and five. So year six compared to year five. Um, oh, geez. I didn't hear the return to five. 
and I get 1.07. Did you all get 1.07 as your growth factor? Yes. Okay. So this is our growth factor in parentheses, what we multiply by to get the next number, the next value. Okay, number three says, what is your result in question to say about the type of growth the account exhibits? So, what type of growth does it look like we have? Exponential. Exponential, we can see that because it's a multiplier and we can see it in the graph. So it looks like it's exponential. And then number four says, find the relative change in value for each year in the table compared to the previous year. What can you conclude? So <clears throat> I'm not sure if you all worked on this, but for instance, if we do um, year zero to year one, we're going to take the new value of 16,050 minus 15,000. So the actual change divided by the original number of 15,000. And then if I did like four to five, I would do the same thing 21038.28 minus 19661.94 over 19661.94. And when we do that, has anybody done theirs already? I'll show you here on my screen. So if I do the relative change, just like I wrote in my paper, it looks like it's 0.07 and 0.07, um, which means if we turn that into a percentage, it means we have a 7% increase. each year. This is our growth rate. So not our growth factor, but our growth rate. <clears throat> so it says find the value of the account after 10 years. Don't multiply 1.07 10 times. That's what exponents are for. So going back to what we um, know about an exponential equation, we learned in lesson 2-1 when we talked about compound interest. It looks like something like this. So we said if we start with 15,000, our multiplier, our growth factor was 1.07 to the 10th. We go to Desmos. We, have, we can put in this one instance, right? So we can just say 15,000 times 1.07 to the 10. And I'm going to share my screen because I don't think I'm sharing that currently. Did everybody get this for their 10th year? Yeah. Carter, I want to make sure you're with me. Shelby, you're good. Yes, I'm good. So for 10 years, we have $29,507.27. If I could just win 15000 now that I, we know what we know, we just leave it there, right? 
Okay, it says use your answer to question three to write an equation in the form, which we just did, of the um, expression where the expression describes the amount of money in the account after X years. So we are going to go back here and we're going to take what we just did here and just write our general equation. So if we're starting with 15,000, we can take 1.07 to the X years. Okay, where 1.07 is 1 plus 0 0.07, which is our growth rate. Um, or we also call that our relative increase, relative change. Okay, so we're growing by 7%, so we're adding 0 0.07 here. Okay, 1.07 is the growth factor. That's our multiplier. So, it says verify, um, <clears throat> number seven says verify that the equation you wrote actually checks out with the table um, that we gave you right here. So if we go to our equation in Desmos, We want to type this, copy that, and put it here. And I'm going to make that a y equals. And I'm going to make this an x. Um, to make the table, we're going to be on that line. The cursor needs to be on that line. And we're going to go to the gear and click on the gear. And then down on that line, I'm going to choose convert to table, not duplicate, but convert to table. So when it converts to table, I'm going to hit my um, magnifying glass. And there it is. Now I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can see my x axis as well. So there it is. Hmm. Well, sometimes it will let me click on the line and move around in the line, and sometimes it won't. Has anybody figured out why it does that sometimes and sometimes it won't? Hmm. It's weird. Okay, so somebody can figure that out. <clears throat> Let me know. Um, we are going to skip this down to the bottom of page 209. We're not going to worry about how they're explaining stuff in Excel spreadsheet, but we I do want to show you um, function notation. So we're not focusing a lot on algebra, but I do want to explain function notation. So function is a relationship between two quantities where each input produces a unique output. And we have that, right? We have the time is producing a unique output output with how um, our value of our account is going to be because of the growth. So in the purple down the bottom of page 209, it says the output of a function named f is described by the symbol, and we say this as f of x. That's how we read it right here, f of x. Warning, never read f of x as f times x is not a multiplication, it's saying f of x. What it, this is a notation saying, when I put x as my input, this is what happens with my function, okay? It's kind of like a machine, um, like if you go to McDonald's and you say, I want um, chocolate ice cream, you know, and they've got the little thing that you pull and the lever comes down and chocolate ice cream comes out, right? Or if they want vanilla, or if you go to Starbucks, right? They they press which kind of coffee that they want. It's the same thing. So we're saying if we put X coffee, you know, in, then this is what's going to come out. If I press X button, this is what's going to come out. That's that's how we read that. So um, we're not going to worry about how they do all these other things in Excel because we're doing stuff um, in um, Desmos. 
So let's go to number, um, let's not worry about eight, but we can worry about number nine. So number nine says, for the function describing the value of our 15,000 investment, find f of 12 and describe what it means. I'll let me work on that for a minute. I'll see if someone can tell me what they think they've come up with. So what do we think f of 12 means or is asking us to do? Um, find the account balance after 12 years. Find the account balance after 12 years. OK, that makes sense because x is equal to 12. OK, so how can we find that? We can go to, anybody have any ideas? There's a couple different ways that we could Find the balance after 12 years. Um, put it into the equation. OK, so as in like right here in this line, I could just go in and type 12, right? Yeah. That's one way. So um, the account value after 12 years is expected to be, we can't guarantee it, but expected to be 33,782 dollars and 87 cents. That's one way. Okay, another way is if you look here in the table, now that we've got Got the table going. I can click on the table and just put 12 there, and it would also retrieve the value for me. <clears throat> um, we could go to 12 in Desmos, but for some reason it's not clicking on that. I'm going to go in and type my equation once more. and not turn it into a table. And the line then should let me click on it and let me go. So I can move around with my left mouse and I can go to where up here, where it's at 12, I'm getting close. There it is. <clears throat> so 33,782. Ooh, also another way, student, I, I know I could do y equals, but yesterday the student said, you can type, um, when x equals, so I can make a new line in Desmos that says x equal to 12, not 21, 12, and it gave me a black line at 12, and if I click on the line where I typed it, then it will put a gray dot right here at the intersection, and you can just go to the gray dot. So there's lots of cool things that Desmos can do for us. Any questions so far on one through nine? Everybody doing okay? Okay, let's move on to number 10. So number 10 says, look back at the graph that illustrates the value of the account. Trace along the graph, um, and it's asking, you know, to notice what the steepness is doing. So we're already right here. So looking at number 10, I'm, I'm in my graph, and I'm just taking my left mouse my left mouse button and you can see there's my $15 that I started with and it's growing you know slowly but quicker quicker and quicker and then we said here at 
year 12 it's like 33,000 and then it's just growing so rapidly it's crazy so I can zoom out more and see where we're going to be at that 40,000 but I think we're going to get to there anyway okay so let's go back to the paper here So graph is growing. Very quickly. <clears throat> Number 11 is our lesson check. So it says, how much interest will you earn from zero to five years into the investment? This will be the difference in the value after five years and the initial investment. You could use a formula for the function they talked about earlier. So we could say F of year five minus F of zero, um, which we know F of five, we can find in a number of different ways. So we could go to our table in Desmos and type in the year five and it will retrieve that amount. So that would be, we should have $21,038.28 if they round appropriately at the bank. And if we subtract our original 15,000, we should have gained $6,038.28. That is our Lesson check, you should be able to just put in 6038 and 28 for the lesson check. I believe I also made it okay to put in the dollar sign, but not needed. So this is our lesson check for today. <clears throat> so number 12 says, how much interest will you earn between years 35 and 40? This time the formula is your only option. So, um, we have to do the function at 40, subtracting the function at 35. So I'm going to go back to my table and I'm going to type in 40. And I'm going to show you how I'm doing that so that everybody is remembering here. So right here in the table, we can type 40 and then hit and right here and then hit enter and type 35. So 40, we have 224, 616 and 87 cents. And then we're going to subtract F of 35, which is 160, 148 and 72 cents. And when we subtract, the difference in those five years is $64,468.15. So looks like we gained a lot more money in years 35 to 40 than we did in years zero to five. That's for sure. So we only gained $6,000 here, we gained 64,000 here. So um, I want everybody to get, get their thoughts for 13 and we can share some answers.
Anybody have any thoughts on number 13? Um, I said the interest is multiplying each year, giving you a higher and higher outcome. Okay. So yeah, it's because we have more in our, our base amount, right, by year 35, and then it's being multiplied. So there's both things going on. So yes, some sweet, sweet moolah. Now, wouldn't we all just have to have $15,000 that we just bought in an account 40 years later? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, um, we're going to move to the second part of Lesson 2.6. It's on page 212. Um, I'm happy to take it. Okay, we're going to work on Lesson 2.6, the second part. So things are going to look a slightly different than what they have with the exponential growth. So we're on page 212. So it says we've now studied exponential growth a couple of different times in this course, but there's a flip side um, and this is exponential decay. The thing that distinguishes exponential growth is that the growth starts off relatively slowly then speeds up dramatically as time passes. Let's see how, how exponential decay compares. Coffee is a popular morning drink because the caffeine that contains acts as a temporary stimulant. Once the caffeine gets into your system, I'm not gonna lie here, I got coffee instead of tea. The amount dissipates exponentially, assuming that you don't add any more, of course. This is Maine. <laughs> Answer every question except for two and six with a full sentence. So similar as before, they gave us um, time zero to seven. It happened to be the amount of caffeine that we started with in our system and what it ended with after seven hours. And then again, our graph goes from zero to 13 hours, even though the data only goes from zero to seven. So using the table or the graph, number one says, how much caffeine was initially in your system? Yeah, 180. 180 milligrams. A lot of space for that. So number two says, find the relative change in caffeine for each one hour period listed in the following table. Remind to um, round to the nearest full percent. I'm gonna remind us of relative change because it's gonna feel weird here. So relative change is new minus old over old. So for instance, for zero to one hours, we're taking the one hour, which is 144 minus what we started, 180 over 180. Okay, so down here, this 144 minus 180 is the actual difference. You know how I've asked you that in a couple of worksheets, what is the actual difference? And then what is the relative difference? So the actual difference is in negative, 36 um, out of 180. So the relative change is a negative value. Oh no, does that seem right? So I get a negative 0.20. And if I do the other ones, if I do this one, oh, geez. I get a negative point two zero. Is everybody getting negative point two zero? Yeah. Does that seem to make sense? <clears throat> because I'm worried. Yes. Why does it make sense? I agree, but. Because you're um, 
going down in numbers, not going up. Okay, so instead of increasing in value, we're decreasing in value. And so it would make sense that we have a decreasing relative change. So we're 20% um, decrease in caffeine. Make sure you tell me per hour. Not year, Sarah, per hour. So per hour, we're decreasing by 20%. This is hours. Okay. Um, let's go to the next page. It says, complete the important statement about exponential change. A quantity either grows or decays exponentially when the blank, blank, and that quantity is blank. Hmm. Uh, so, relative change is negative. Yeah, they only gave us one space here. Relative change, I agree with that. And I would say is negative, but then it's not really growing, right? It's decaying when it's negative. So <clears throat> it's growing when it's positive and it's decaying when it's negative. I agree there, Shelby. So number four says, looking at the graph of the caffeine remaining in your system, describe what exponential decay looks like compared to exponential growth. So how would we describe it using the graph? Um, it starts out moving faster and then levels off. Okay, starts out moving faster. So yep. Um, okay, I like that. Starts out. Then levels off. Okay. That's L. Levels off. I like that. <clears throat> um, and from left to right, it goes downhill, right? So it moves in this direction as decay. So number five says, what's the multiplication factor that you need to multiply by a previous year's amount to get the next year's, um, the next hour's amount? So the previous hour's amount to get the next hour's amount. And you can use the hint or use other resources that we use from before with our table. We need to come up. What is our multiplication factor that we have to multiply by? Um, eighty percent, so point eight. Eighty percent. Oh, where'd you get that? Um, because we have a decrease of negative 20%, so 80% is remaining. Okay, I like how you said so 80% is remaining. Because we're, we're taking away from the original 100%. So from 100%. Original, we're taking away 20%, so 80% is remaining. Okay. <clears throat> I also would like you to see that um, what I said before, our growth factor 
the multiplier, right? That's just right here, the multiplier, which is B in our equation, is equal to one plus the relative change. Now, back on the last one, our relative change was 0 0.07, right? So our relative change was um, 0 0.07. So we added that and we got 1.07 was our multiplier. <clears throat> but um, now our relative change is a negative 0 0.20. So when we take one plus a negative 0 0.20, we only have 0.8 remaining. So use your question, answer to question five to write a function of the form f of x with expression that describes the amount of caffeine left in your system after x hours. So it's still y, but we're calling it f of x. We have our starting amount, which was 180 milligrams. And now we're multiplying by 0.8 to the x. with me on that one. So moving to 214, um, it says using a graphing calculator to verify that your equation provides the table values like we did before. So let's go to Desmos um, here. Do we see my decimal screen here? So, okay. So we're going to type in our equation that we think is true and right, which is y equals 180 parentheses 0 point to the x. Okay. And then I'm going to go to my gear and hit table. And I'm going to hit my magnifying glass just to I don't know why I don't want to scroll on that. So I'm gonna because I want to move around on there. I'm gonna say y equals 180 plus 0 0.8 plus to the x. Okay, now now that it's in blue, whoops, in blue, I can click on it and move around along there on the slider scale. Okay, so number seven, we did that. We put it in the graph. It says, use the function you wrote to find the amount of coffee left in your system after 150 minutes. So I'll let you all work on that for a moment. Fifteen minutes. I'm not getting much in your system after 15 minutes. So, what do we have to do here? Can I just put 150 in my X? Um, no, first you have to do the 150 divided by 60 so you can get it to hours. Oh. 
So we're doing a little unit exchange, which we've done already this semester, kind of getting us ready for the midterm here. 150 divided by 60 is 2.5 hours. Okay. Um, and then we can put that in for X. So we can go to our slider, we can go to our table, we can do a number of different things, which hopefully everybody's getting comfortable doing. So in Desmos here, I could go to my table and type 2.5 <clears throat> and find out that it would be about 103.04 milligrams of caffeine. We could also go to, um, you could just slide along on your slider here to 2.5 and find out that way. You could also go to a line in Desmos that says X equals 2.5, right? And then it gives you the gray intersect with a black line. So that's another way. Is everybody on my live people good with that? Lots of different ways we can <clears throat> find um, an X value. So we got two and a half hours. Nine says use the graph to estimate the amount of time needed for the amount of caffeine to drop to 40 milligrams. Describe how you found your answer. And so nine and 10 are kind of together depending on how you find your answer to nine. So everybody work on that for a minute and, and we'll share answers. Well, let me know if anybody's wanting to share how they found out when there will only be 40 milligrams of coffee in your system. Um, I just dragged my mouse along the line until it got to 40. Oh, okay, that's an option. I'm gonna share my screen and see if any, oh, I'm already sharing in the camera. So I can grab this and just drag it until I get to 40 on the Y, right? So it's gonna be over here. So I'm gonna to need to move my graph. So I'm getting close. Oh, I'm super close. So close, I just can't land on it. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. So right about 6.8, 6.75 hours. <clears throat> Is that what you came up with, Stephen? Yeah. 6.76 or 6.74 hours. And that's one way. Anybody else do a different way? Did you just do y equals 40? Mm hmm. I could say y equals 40. And then oops, <clears throat> I go back up to that y equals 40. And then when I click on the line y equals 40, where I typed it, it will automatically put a gray dot for the intersection with the other lines that are on. And it says 6.74, just like we suspected. 
<clears throat> so that's another another way. Now you could try to do it by hand, but we haven't really done anything sophisticated enough with algebra to do that. And that's okay because our goal in this class is not to learn how to do algebra, to learn a little bit about algebra and feeling comfortable with the symbols, but allowing Desmos to do the behind the scenes work so that we can do the real life interpretation, right? That's the goal. So essentially, um, when Steven said he used a slider, like moving his mouse, that's basically the answer to number 10. <clears throat> so how about if we look at, <clears throat> sorry, number 11 is our last piece here. Um, go to that. Oh. <clears throat> And it says, make up a situation that could be modeled by each of the following exponential graphs. As always, extra points for creativity. <laughs> so we're trying to think of a situation that could be modeled by both of those. Um, doesn't the population go up by exponential? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think we're going to learn about that in two seven, actually. Um, it did for a lot of years, and it kind of is now that we're going to actually look on that in two seven. So, yeah, so we could say population growth. Population growth of a lot of animals does grow exponentially for sure. Um, anybody think of one besides coffee for decay? <clears throat> Chemical half lives. What was it? Chemical half lives. Okay, chemical half lives. Wow, that was technical. You are right. And it's half life. <clears throat> <clears throat> Can you be more specific, or do you want me to be more specific? Like, um, like an example of one, maybe. Um, I don't know any offhand, but <laughs> I remember studying it in my organic chemistry class. There you go, shall we? Um, <clears throat> so I can't remember what test it is, but I had to have a, an e, not an EKG, MRI, I think. I don't know. <clears throat> I had to have something of my kidney when I went to donate my kidney. So um they inject you which it, with a dye, so uh, a chemical dye, and the dye goes through your system really quick, and that's what like helps scan your whatever organ they're trying to scan. And so it has a half life so quick that they literally have to inject it as you're going through the machine. It's really kind of a cool thing, <clears throat> and it comes out of you just that quick as well. So um, that's definitely a an, um, what. Shelby was referring to for a chemical half-life. So that finishes to six. So we have an option for everyone that's live on the call. You can either choose to watch the two seven videos or 